خاطب الحور الحسان وطالبا لوصالهن بجنة الحيوان أسرع وحث السير جاهدك إنما مسراك هذا ساعة لزمان هي جنة طابت وطاب نعيمها فنعيمها باق وليس بثان وبناء Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah do not affirm nor reject any name or attribute not implicitly mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah. Instead, they ask its meaning, and if it carries a false meaning, non attributable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they reject it. And if it carries a meaning which is true and befitting of the Lord, the Rabbil Alameen, then we accept it. Allah the Almighty's exaltedness is from the attributes that have to do with his essence, thatia, and it is of two types, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exalted in and of himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is to believe that Allah the Almighty himself is above all of his creation, and he ascended above his throne. This has to do with the exaltedness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his self, his thatia. The second type of exaltedness, exaltedness, is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine attributes. And that is, Allah the Almighty is described with perfection and majestic attributes that possess no shortcomings or imperfections in any way. Allah is perfect. His attributes are perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascribes to himself that he is with his creation, ma'iyya. And this is of two types. There are two types in which Allah, or two ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with his creation. Number one, the general way, which means that Allah, the, uh, Allah's sovereignty, his power, his knowledge, encompass all of the creation, from the believer to the disbeliever, and nothing of their actions escape him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is with you wherever you are. So nothing escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Nothing escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra or his power. And nothing escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's all seeingness and his ability to hear all things. Allah hears everything. He sees everything. He is knowledge that encompasses everything. And this is one of the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is with us. The second way is the specific way. And it encompasses a nasra, which we talked about in the previous lecture. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He supports and has per, uh, protection, which is only for the Ahl Tawheed, only for those who deserve due to possessing the correct belief. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has patience and uh, is patient and for those people who are patient and those people who have taqwa, they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear breaking his commands and they have uh, ihsan, that they worship Allah as if they see him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with them by helping them, by giving them support. The shaykh went on to mention after that, he mentioned that there is no contradiction between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's exaltedness above his creation and his being with his creation, meaning being with his creation uh, through knowledge. Because being with his creation does not necessitate that Allah mixes with his creation or is physically settles down with his creation in a particular place or etc. As those people who who only believe with their logic. They only use their intellect and their logic to support what they believe. Ahl sunnah we go with the text. We go with the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we stop where the salaf asali, where the, the pious predecessors stop, where the sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, where they stopped. We don't use our intellect to say, oh no, it doesn't make sense like this, or I think it means like this, or my intellect shows me that it means this. No. But we stop where the text stop. 
So because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation and he also is with his creation through his knowledge and through his power and through his knowing and his all seeing and his all hearing, that doesn't mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mixes with his creation. For example, those people of falsehood who say that Allah, for example, is everywhere. And what they mean by that is Allah is as everywhere physically. So if you believe that, that then it means you believe Allah is with you in the bathroom and Allah is with you here. A'udhu billah min dhalika. This is falsehood. This is false belief. But rather, Ahl Sunnah believes, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa showed us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us in his knowledge. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us and hears us and nothing escapes from him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh, after illustrating for us and describing Tawheed, the monotheism, he moved on to another very important aspect of creed, creed and that is that which negates uh, Tawheed. And of course, that which negates Tawheed is what? Is shirk, is, uh, is polytheism. Tawheed is monotheism. It is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshiping Him and Him alone in accordance with His divine names and attributes. But shirk is the opposite of that. And it is the greatest sin. It is polytheism. And it is of two categories, the major shirk and the minor shirk. The major shirk, this means to associate a, par uh, a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any or all of the categories of his oneness, of tawheed. And there is no forgiveness for the one who commits this shirk and does not repent before his or her death. And he or she will abide in the hellfire forever. This is the person who dies upon major shirk. The second category is the minor shirk, and it is of two types as well, the open shirk and the hidden shirk. The open minor shirk is from the tongue and the limbs, like making uh, oaths by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for example, if someone says, if it weren't for Allah and so and so, this is a type of minor shirk. And the attachment to uh, amulets, and if one believes it to be one of the causes for removing misfortune or harm and protection from it. So example, someone who hangs an amulet on their door or someone who wears an amulet on their, uh, on their wrist or around their, like a, a necklace. And they believe that this necklace is going to help them or give them good luck or something. This is a type of shirk. So Muslims should be far removed from this. Do not wear bracelets and wear uh, amulets and things believing that these amulets will give you support. And the best thing is to stay far away from any kind of uh, bracelets and things like this, except for those things which are permissible to wear, like wearing a ring, the silver ring like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore to follow his sunnah. But other than this, avoid these things. Avoid these things and do not believe in these things because nothing is going to give you, uh, remove misfortune from you or give you protection except Allah the Almighty. This is where we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second type of the minor shirk is the hidden shirk, which means a riya. This is a type of showing off. So it is desiring or intending to please someone else in worship, like showing off to achieve fame and deeds for worldly gains. And this type of shirk does not take someone out of the fold of Islam, but it weakens their tawheed, it weakens their monotheism, their Islamic creed and, and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should avoid shirk at all costs. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَخْوَ فَمَا خَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ أَشْرِكَ الْأَسْكَرَ الْأَسْكَرَ فَسُؤْلِ عَنْهُ فَقَالْ الْرِيَا So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was uh, said, the thing that I fear the most for my nation is the minor shirk. And then he was asked about it. And he said, uh, it is riya, meaning the minor shirk. So this type of showing off. For example, uh, we mentioned that the people who will be asked on Yom Al-Qiyamah, the first three, uh, will be, in al-awwal nas yuqda alayhi Yom Al-Qiyamah rajun ustushida fa'utiya bi fa'arrafahu ni'amu fa'arrafaha. So the first man who will be asked on the day of judgment will be a person who will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a martyr. And he will be asked about this. And he'll say, I did it for your sake. And Allah will say, 
قال فما عملت فيها he will ask and what did you do he said قتلت فيك فحتى استشهد and I fought until I was martyred for you and then Allah will say كذبت ولكنك فعلت لي قال هو شجاع فقد كيل ثم أمر به فصحب على وجهه ثم ألقى في النار so this person who's brought before Allah, who said that they died for the sake of fighting for the sake of Allah, that they died as a martyr. Allah will say you lied, but rather you did it so that the people would say you were a brave man, and they said this about you. فَقَدْ كِيلْ Then he will be dragged into the hellfire on his face. وَعِيَاذَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ This is the result of that type of shirk, of showing off for the people. And the next person is the person who sought knowledge, who was a teacher, who was the sheikh, who was the talab al-ilm, who was the person who called to Islam or called to, to Allah. At least that's what they did on the outward. But in fact, inwardly, they did it to show off in front of the people. They did so so that their name would be mentioned. They did so that they could call to themselves. They did so so they could show off in front of the people. And what is the natija or the result for this person? Is they'll be thrown in the hellfire. They'll be dragged in their face on the hellfire. So seeking knowledge and calling to a, uh, Islam, propagating the message of Islam, can be one of the highest deeds. It can get you into paradise. It can help you and raise your level. Because the prophets, alayhim after salatu salam, they call to a tawheed. And they call to Allah. And this is one of the greatest things that they were sent with. But... If you're not sincere for Allah and you have shirk in it, then it can also get you into the hellfire. And it can get you to the lowest depths of the hellfire if you do it purely for the sake of the other people, committing the major shirk and, and, and being dragged into the fire. Wa'iyadh billah. So we should avoid shirk at all cost. The ways that lead to the major shirk are, for example, number one, Words that uh, appear to associate partners with Allah, like one saying, if it weren't for Allah and so-and-so, or what Allah willed and so-and-so willed. Another way in which can lead to the major shirk, for example, is making oaths to others uh, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing, the third thing, is showing off in acts of worship, which we've already mentioned. The fourth thing is taking graves as places of worship. And that includes placing a grave in the mosques, or building a mosque on a grave, or praying inside a mosque with a grave inside it, or towards a grave, meaning having a grave in front of your mosque. This is also a way that leads to the major shirk. So I advise my Muslim brothers and sisters, wherever they may be, to avoid this at all costs. Stay away from praying in masajid that have graves in them or building a, a, a mosque that has a, over on top of a grave. Stay away from this at all costs. This is the major, leads to the major shirk. And the people who do this with the intention of worshiping those people in the graves or using those people in the graves as a means to get to Allah, this is major shirk. How many Muslims, uh, how many Muslim countries contain these practices in non-Muslim countries? where the people, they, mo they make uh, circumbul circumbulation around the graves, meaning they make tawaf. Like we go around the Kaaba in Mecca, they go around the graves. Look at how the Shia, the Rafida, they go around the graves of Khomeini. They go around the graves of their, their uh, imams of misguidance. They go around their graves believing that they're coming closer to Allah, believing that these people are saints, believing that these people will bring them closer to Allah, that these people will help them have children, that these people will have, help them have wealth. How many people go to the graves and, you know, they believe that uh, the Tijani, uh, uh, the, 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 the leader of their sect, or Abdul Qadir Jailani, or so-and-so, or so-and-so, all of these people who, who are saints, according to them, and they go to them, and they actually uh, make a, a type of shirk with them by taking their fruits and vegetables to their graves to believe that they'll be worship, or slaughtering an animal at their graves. All of these are means to the major shirk or are a form of the major shirk and can take you out of the fold of Islam. We also know this is the case with some of our brothers and sisters in Ethiopia, that they go to the grave of that great, um, that great, uh, Tabi'i, uh, Najashi, 
anhu, may Allah be pleased with him and may Allah have mercy upon him, who, you know, met those Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum and helped them and supported them. They made Hijra, the first Hijra to Ethiopia and, and uh, Najashi became a Muslim. But now what have the people done? Some of the people worship him. They go to his grave and you can see the pictures of it and you can find it. If you go to Ethiopia, you'll find the people go to the, his grave and they make tawaf. This is shirk. This is kufr. This leads you astray and this will take you out of the fold of Islam. So avoid this at all cost. Make dua, supplicate for him, not to him. Another way in which people uh, go astray and, and, and is a means to uh, shirk is by having extremism in building mausoleums and being excessive in their building their graves, big uh, domes and so forth. In addition to what is mentioned, also uh, is building them or writing on their tombstones and marking upon their graves and building big domes upon them and other than that. We find that the Shia Rafida, they do this. This is a part of their practice. We find that many of the extreme Sufis, they do this and so forth. And so we have to avoid these practices at all costs for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of anyone else, only for Allah because this is shirk, because this can take you out of the fold of Islam. And this is a means, a wasila to shirk in anything. As the fuqaha, as the scholars of jurisprudence, they mention, a wasail laha afkam al maqasid. That means that that the means to something takes that same ruling. So, meaning, if you do something, something, for example, that leads to shirk, that means every step of the way leading to that, whatever will help you in getting to that shirk, is haram as well, because shirk is haram and shirk is polytheism. So those things which lead you to that polytheism are also uh, uh, haram. And likewise, the things that you do good, for example, the one who walks to the masjid, the one who follows the sunnah, those things which help them follow the sunnah, those things which help them get to the masjid, they will receive reward from this. So al-ahkam, uh, al-wasail al-ahkam al-maqasid, that the, the means to something takes the same ruling as the thing you're trying to achieve. Another way in which leads to shirk is making an exerted journey to a place intending to come closer to Allah other than the three masajid which are mentioned in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ's Masjid in Medina, and Masjid al-Aqsa in Palestine. These are the only three places where it is permissible to make an exerted journey to uh, do ibadah, to do worship. That doesn't mean it's not permissible to visit, uh, you know, to, to travel to places, of course not. But to make your intention to go pray and get reward in a particular masjid other than those three masajid is not permissible. It's not permissible for me to say I'm going to make an exerted journey to go to Seattle, Washington to go worship in Masjid Abu Bakr. That's not permissible. Or I'm going to make an exerted journey to go to Ghana and worship, worship in Masjid such and such. Or go to this city and go to worship in Masjid such and such. No. But instead, maybe you're going there to seek knowledge. You're going there because you're doing business. You're going there for whatever, and you go pray in there. But not to make your exerted journey, except to Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, Masjid al uh, uh, in uh, Masjid uh, or Nabuwa in uh, Medina, and Masjid al-Aqsa in Palestine. Bas. The next way in which a person can uh, that leads to shirk is extremist practices in revering the righteous. And again, we touched on this, and it's very important that the Muslims, that we realize this, that no one can answer your supplication except Allah. That if you seek help, as the Prophet Muhammad said, seek it from Allah. Seek your support from Allah. Worship Allah alone, because all of those are acts of ibadah. The Prophet ﷺ said, a dua hu ibadah. This is in Sahih Tirmidhi, that uh, supplication is worship. So that means 
when you supplicate, those people who go to the grave of the Prophet وسلم, and they supplicate to him and say, O Nabi Allah, please give me children. O Nabi Allah, give me wealth. O Nabi Allah, please bless us. Please do this. Please do this. That this is falsehood. This is haram and this is shirk. Because you're ascribing a partner to Allah. To, and only Allah can answer your dua and, and uh, to, to fulfill those needs for you. And only Allah can protect you and lift the difficulties that you're having in your life. Supplicate to Allah alone. And what's the evidence for this again? Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ad-du'a hu ibadah. That supplication, it is worship. And Allah orders us to make dua to Him all throughout the Qur'an, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, the last way the shaykh mentioned was also taking pictures can be a means for shirk because we look at how many people revere those pictures. That we should avoid being excessive and taking pictures just for personal needs. If it's maybe some of the scholars, they say, for the sake of da'wah, that you do videos and things like this, that, that has a different ruling. But the person who takes pictures, just the family pictures and so forth, we should be cautious about that because that can lead to, uh, it can be a means to shirk because some people, as we see, they take their pictures, they take their statues and so forth. And this is how the people of Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam, the people after him, the, the, that they, they went astray by building idols or building statues for those righteous people. There was actually righteous saints and they wanted to honor, revere those saints. They began by building statues. The people after them, they took those statues as a form of a reverence and worship. And then it just began from there. So we have to be cautious of any kind of uh, things that will be a means to falling into shirk. This brings up the next point that the Shaykh mentioned, he mentioned the concept of tawassal, of intercession. And intercession, it is drawing close to something. And it has uh, two categories. The first is the lawful type of intercession. And it has several types. So there's several lawful types of intercessions. Uh, the first type is drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his names and attributes, by his divine names and attributes, meaning supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his divine names and attributes. This is the type of intercession. You're seeking intercession by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes. Another type is drawing closer to Allah, the Almighty, with good deeds, uh, which the one seeking intercession has performed. For example, as we know the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the people who were in the cave, the three people, and they mentioned their good deeds and sins that they avoided, and it caused the rock to be, uh, the cave door to be unblocked. It moved the, the rock that was blocking and preventing them from leaving the cave. That this was a type of intercession, seeking intercession, uh, to come closer to Allah the Almighty with their good deeds, by mentioning their good deeds. Oh Allah, I did this. If I did this for your sake, please help me in such and such manner. The third type of permissible intercession is drawing closer to Allah the Almighty through the perfect realization of Tawheed, meaning being perfect in your, uh, your worship of Allah alone, avoiding shirk in all of its various forms. Being like the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, سَبَعُونَ أَلْفِ يُدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ وَلَا عَذَابٍ That the Prophet ﷺ mentioned those 70,000 people who would enter Jannah without uh, any accounting or reckoning and without being punished. That is the actual, that's the actualization of Tawheed, of monotheism. The fourth type of way in which we can seek intercession uh, and, and draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, is through making oneself, uh, realizing one's weakness and neediness apparent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by supplicating to Allah and mentioning your weakness. Look at the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how beautiful, how beautiful all of his duas and supplications were. By learning those supplications, making ourselves humble. But listen to this one dua, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned uh, that that a dua that we should say Subhan uh, la ilaha illa ant Subhanaka inni kuntu min al where Allah uh, the where uh, the dua which means there is no God worthy of worship except you 
meaning to Allah. This is, you're, you're humbling yourself. You're, you're negating all false worship to Allah. And you're directing all your worship. La ilaha illa ant. There is no God worthy of worship except you. Illa ant. Subhanaka. All glory belongs to you. Inni kuntu min adhalimeen. Verily I was one of the wrong uh, doers. So here you are humbling yourself before Allah. You're mentioning that, yes, you are in need of Allah and that you're a sinner and that Allah is perfect and you are in need of Him and you're praising Him and Him alone and directing all worship to Him and Him alone. And this is a way to seek intercession from your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala by showing your neediness to Him and supplicating to Him and Him alone. Another which way, which is mashroor or permissible to seek intercession from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, coming closer to Allah the Almighty by asking a righteous living person to supplicate for you, not the dead. We don't go to the Prophet sallallahu grave and ask him to uh, do anything for us. We give our salams to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But we don't supplicate to him. So if we do not supplicate to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what about other than him? Of course we don't supplicate to the Sahaba. Of course we don't supplicate to the awliya, the, the saints, and those righteous people. And of course we don't supplicate to those people who are other than them. Just as we don't support the Christians su supplicating to Jesus. They say in the name of God, the Father, the Holy Spirit. They say in the name of Jesus. I do this in the name of Jesus. This is what they say. Isn't this the same thing? So what makes it different because you say la ilaha illallah and then you want to supplicate to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's the difference? What's the difference whether you supplicate to a prophet or a tree or a stone or a rabbit or a rat? Just like the Hindus. وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلَكَ But in fact, direct all your worship, all of your supplication to Allah, the one who hears you, the one who can meet your deeds, the one who is the only one worthy of worship. So coming closer to Allah by asking a righteous living person to supplicate for you. And even the Salaf al-Saleh, Ridwan Allah alayhim, they used to kind of dislike, some of the Salaf used to dislike actually supplicating to, uh, uh, seeking uh, even from a righteous living person. They preferred to supplicate directly to Allah alone instead of asking a righteous person to supplicate on their behalf. Also, another very important point to look at, did the Sahaba, did they supplicate to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam after he died, or ask him to supplicate, or ask him to carry their prayers for, for, for them? No, we don't have any athar of the Salaf that shows that they did this. Did the Tabi'een do it? No. Did the Atba'a Tabi'een do it? No. So if the Salaf Asali didn't do it, why should we do it? Why should we bring a new innovation into the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is Allah's religion. This day I perfected for you your religion. I perfected Islam for you. And I'm pleased with it for you as your religion. This is what our Lord said. The Prophet wasallam said as narrated in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. من أثث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد. Whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have it rejected. So supplicate to Allah. Don't go to and and it's permissible to supplicate and ask a righteous living person to supplicate on your behalf. But don't supplicate to them. Don't supplicate to the dead or the living. Supplicate to Allah. Al Hayyu Al Qayyum. Subhanahu wa Taala. يا خاطب الحور الحسان وطالبا لوصالهن بجنة الحيوان أسرع وحث السير جاهدك إنما مسراك هذا ساعة لزمان